So. Now, my, my friend Ben Kazanoka, he's always talking to me about this idea of life hacks, like advice where you can live your life or learn things more efficiently. And let's say I was approaching foreign language literature in translation as an economist, and the following life hack occurred to me. I'm going to lay it out, and you tell me why it's <laughs> wrong. There's always more to read, always more wonderful things to read in yeah. all of the major languages. But if you can read a language fluently, usually you'll enjoy the fiction or poetry in that language much more. So you're not going to run out of things to read in the languages you can read in. So therefore, in translated literature, you should read like the very most famous works. So if you don't read Russian, yes, read Brothers Karamazov and War and Peace, and a few things, and then stop. And if you read, say, English, Spanish, and French, then just read in those languages and translated literature at the margin, put it aside, never look at it again. Now, that's not what you do, but what's wrong with that argument? Uh, well, I think you're really missing so much because uh, yeah. the problem is finding what's, uh, what is of value, what is important. Uh, and uh, I mean, we have these established books like War and Peace or Crime and Punishment, uh, but Russian literature goes so, so much deeper, for example, to take just a, a, an example of a big language. Um, and it, it also changes with time so rapidly. I, th I think that uh, in every 10 year period, you could select uh, a new set of a dozen recent, relatively recent of the past quarter century from that culture, mm -hmm. uh, works which would be, give you a completely different view uh, and uh, yeah, provide you with a d uh, completely different um, experience. Uh, and the bigger problem I see, of course, is that you're uh, missing out on so much literature from elsewhere, that there really is, um, in, for a lot of uh, cultures and languages, there isn't that standout that you know, you know, oh, Russia, Tolstoy, got it. Uh, but if you uh, want to read something from the Philippines, you're unlikely to be able to find that, that uh, one author. And there's so many other languages and cultures. Uh, and there's so much being written now, which uh, it really is worthwhile keeping up with. But would you agree then that it's a good life hack, say, for poetry? So if I try to read poetry originally written in Russian, uh, I don't speak Russian, I understand some of it. I know enough to get that I'm not getting it mm -hmm. when I read it in English. It just doesn't come through no matter how great the poet, mm -hmm. and I don't enjoy it that much. So. In this case, I followed the life hack. I just don't read poetry in Russian, and I feel that's efficient. Do you agree with that when it comes to poetry? So, but I do read poetry in the languages I read well. Uh, yeah, uh, poetry is a bit more difficult because, uh, first of all, there seems uh, a lot more with fewer, the, uh, less poetry that stands out. It's very difficult uh, often to recognize the, the great poetry of the day in the time being. Uh, especially with modern poetry, I find <coughs> it very difficult to get a sense of what I really should be focusing on. Um, so, I mean, I guess it, it is a useful life hack because really there is only so much we can read. Um, and I might very well <laughs> act similarly with poetry because I don't spend that much time reading poetry. Uh, but with fiction, I, I, I wouldn't accept it, no. Here's another life hack which I totally reject but it may just be because I'm an addict of sorts, but you tell me why for you it's wrong. A lot of people say to me, well, I love fiction, but I'm never gonna read new works because I can't tell what's really good. I'll just wait 20 years and then look back on what was truly excellent from 20 years ago and read that 20 years later. But in the meantime, now I'll just read classics or things in other areas which are verified as being truly excellent. Does that make sense? Uh, well, I, I worry very much about people <laughs> who rely on you know, what gets that stamp of approval. And um, just because it's, mm -hmm. it's been, you know, has a cover review in the New York Times Book Review uh, does not mean that that book really is, you know, if we look at it from five or 10 years down the road, that that book will still be a significant work. Uh, and I find so much which is highly praised at any one point, uh, long term, uh, won't be. And again, uh, however, but then wait longer, that, wait right, 30 years. Well, much that we look back on is we've lost in the margins as well mm -hmm. because it's really hard to keep track of all the great books. Uh, and uh, we, we saw it strand earlier today, Stoner, uh, John Williams. This is a book that disappeared from view for a long time. Yes. It was always recognized sort of, I mean, people would say this is a great book, but it, it had really fallen 
uh, out of you. Uh, Helen DeWitt's The Last Samurai was just republished. I just ordered it on Amazon. I'm excited to get my copy. I uh, didn't know about it. Uh, right, and uh, this was sort of a, a uh, not legendary text, but it had gotten a, a great deal of attention <coughs> when it first came out. Uh, and then through odd series of coincidence, it just sort of fell, fell from view. And there are many, many, many more books which are in this, you know, gray zone where if you really dig, if you really look, you could still pluck them out. But uh, because there's so, there's so much new work being published, um, it's very difficult for it to rise out of that noise.